Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much to Dr. Paul for the warm introduction and uh, uh, for all of you, bright and early here. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, today, my topic uh, uh, of the lecture will be on failure modes and effects analysis. Um, and uh, I'll talk about uh, um, the usefulness and the applicability in healthcare. Have uh, any of you heard about failure modes and effects analysis? Yes? I see one. Anybody else? Good, right. Excellent. Paul. Okay. So, I'm in good company then. So, hopefully this will be a good opportunity to provide information to some and uh, refresh uh, some of the knowledge of the others. I have no conflict of interest and uh, no financial re relationships to disclose. Um, I will not be discussing off-label or investigation use of products and uh, no generic uh, names will be used. Now these are the learning objectives uh, that uh, we identified for the session. Uh, first is to uh, introduce uh, the concepts of uh, failure modes and effects analysis to the audience and explain the relevance and uh, the development of uh, failure modes and effects analysis in healthcare. It also helps us to support um, meeting uh, some of the accreditation standards and uh, build capacity in terms of uh, implementing uh, uh, this tool at ASPETAR. Uh, it also helps to implement uh, uh, FMEA as part of the planning and the design uh, uh, process. Now this will be the outline of my presentation. Uh, uh, first of all, we'll define what FMEA is um, and uh, the applicability. What are the steps that uh, you would take uh, in terms of implementation of this tool and how would you develop an action plan and uh, uh, a, an example of an exercise as well as uh, a short summary. Now in terms of uh, the definition, failure modes and effects analysis is a method that is designed to first of all identify and understand what are the potential failure modes? Because generally in any process, there will be aspects of the process that have a potential to fail more than the others, right? This is, this is common. So now, this tool gives you an opportunity to identify proactively, proactively is you know, before it actually happens, in terms of uh, what those uh, weak links can be. Then it helps us to understand what is the effect of that failure because each failure will have a different impact, right? So what is the impact of each of those failure modes? Then we will be able to assess uh, the risk which is associated with each of those failure steps or failure modes and then based on the impact, we will be able to prioritize the issues for either corrective action or change of course or direction. And then we will also be able to identify and carry out corrective actions as required through a prioritization matrix. And this again depends on the severity of the um, impact. Now what is FMEA? It is an analysis which is done by cross a cross-functional team of experts. You, ne you need to make sure that you have uh, multidisciplinary representation related to that topic uh, on your team. It thoroughly analyzes the system or the designs or the processes. And it generally has to start early in the development process for you to have the maximum benefit. It helps to identify weaknesses that you can improve and streamline. Now, how is this different uh, to the other quality improvement tools that uh, have been in vogue and uh, have been more popular? First of all, it's proactive. Uh, it is actually working on an issue before it has actually cropped up. It's practical. It is systematic. It is team-based because you are involving multiple people from different professions. It helps to reduce the risk of harm to patients and staff before it has actually taken place, so you are able to change course, like I said. But remember, it doesn't help to fix failures after they happen, unlike root cause analysis, which is kind of uh, a solution to uh, go and do an in-depth uh, deep dive into 
uh, issues and uh, find out what the failures are. So th that's the uh, aspect that you need to keep in mind when uh, you are working on a FMEA. Does any, any one of you remember the Columbia disaster? Yeah? You know, the disaster was not caused by lack of planning. It was actually one small foam on the outer surface of the satellite that came off. And that's what destroyed it. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that small steps or small failures in a process can have a large impact. So this is what uh, this process helps to identify. Now, like a lot of quality improvement tools, the history of uh, FMEA goes back in the industry. It was actually started by NASA in uh, uh, 1963, and uh, it plays a major, major role in uh, aeronautical industry as well as aerospace. Uh, because they spend uh, maybe two, three months uh, just in terms of uh, looking at each workflow, doing FMEAs on um, most of them so that they can identify the uh, failure modes. Uh, it's also used in uh, uh, nuclear engineering because there's high impact, you know, terrible consequences. Uh, it has also been adapted in the automotive industry and uh, um, it has reached out to different uh, healthcare branches now. And uh, there has been uh, increased application. Now, when do you use an FMEA? It has to be either in the early part of a process improvement, that is in the design and build phase, or it could be um, later in order to improve an existing system. So those are the two opportunities for us to use an FMEA. Of course, uh, root cause analysis uh, we could use when there is a specific error that has uh, occurred. So this, this is the continuum. Those are the two opportunities, one on the left and one on the right. Now, how will FMEA help us? It will help us to prioritize the list of potential failures or the potential uh, steps where the process might fail. And we can see what happens when the failure occurs and what's the impact on the customer, in our case, the patient and the staff, and what are the likely causes of failure. So maybe we can put in a better mitigation aspect, or we are able to change the process uh, in order to improve it. It's best for the analysis of a system, but not an incident unlike RCA, which is more incident-based. Now, with reference to FMEA in healthcare, it has been used um, widely now, and uh, uh, the rationale is the same, to take a look into the future before a project or a system has actually been designed, or you know, when the system is a little mature and you want to um, relook at it and uh, see if there can be some change in direction. What are the benefits of the FMEA? Uh, there is improved design and build. You can optimize the process, prevent errors. You can reduce costs, costs of rework, uh, redesign, uh, so on and so forth. You can also identify what are the critical aspects of the system so you can focus on them more, right? Now, there are four steps to conducting a FMEA. The first step is to map the process end-to-end, -end, from start to finish. And this, again, requires the input of that multidisciplinary team, because they will bring different aspects into play. Then you would start looking into what are the steps where it could go wrong, what are the failure modes. Then for each of those failure modes, you are going to look at the causes that might cause that failure. How could the failure happen? And then finally, you are going to look at the failure effects. What would be the consequences of each of those failure steps? Now, why would you use FMEA? In order to evaluate processes for possible failures and prevent them before they actually happen, and the emphasis is on prevention 
rather than mitigation of any harm after it occurs. It's also an ACI requirement uh, that we do one FMEA on an annual basis. Now, um, FMEA has been particularly useful in uh, improving an existing system or before it has actually been implemented. And uh, it also helps us to assess the impact of pro proposed change on an existing system. For example, if you are moving from one system to the other, we can use this to evaluate and actually put a business case forward in terms of the viability of that project or process. It also helps us to identify the potential impact of any change that uh, we might be proposing, and we might be able to track and trend over time, so we can gauge the uh, success of any project. Now, this is a seven-step process. The first step is you need to select a process to evaluate with FMEA, so come up with a topic, a theme. Now, once you have come home on that topic or theme, you need to recruit a multidisciplinary team that consists of all the people who have some stake in that uh, topic. Then make sure the team meets together to list all the steps in the process. This is the end-to-end -end process mapping. And then have the team list all the failure steps or the failure modes, the causes, as well as the effects. And for each failure mode, you need to have the team assign something called a risk priority number. The risk priority number depends on three aspects. One is the likelihood of that failure happening. Two is the severity of that failure. And three is the detectability of the failure. Now, just to give you some more information on detectability, detectability is how easy it is to detect that a failure has happened. Because sometimes, a lot of failures might go in unde uh, undetected in the system till it's really late. So each of these elements would be marked on a scale of 1 to 10. For uh, likelihood, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 is uh, less likely and 10 is highly likely. Severity again, 1 is low severity, 10 is high on the severity scale. Detectability again, 1 is easily detectable, 10 is very tough to detect. So those are the three parameters that we'd use in order to come up with a risk priority number. And then you would evaluate the results based on your risk priority numbers. And uh, the higher the risk priority number, the higher it goes on your prioritization matrix in terms of action planning. So those are the seven steps. Actually, I have a nice video that might uh, help to stratify this learning. Okay, we need some volume at the back. Is it a Yeah, I think he's coming. Pardon? Uh, I think he has to do some setting at the back there. Okay, let me run through the presentation till we get some tech support. Okay, uh, in terms of uh, those three aspects that we discussed, likelihood of occurrence, like I said, um, one to 10, one is uh, highly unlikely, 10 is very likely to occur. Detection again, one to 10, and severity, one to 10. There's a nice matrix that has been proposed by um, the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, uh, which is kind of the quality improvement uh, guru. You list all the steps in the process on the left, and then identify the failure modes. What are the causes for the failure? What are the effects? Likelihood detection, severity, the risk priority number, and what are the actions you would take in order to prevent the failure? Then you can also sum up all the risk priority numbers so that you are in a position to review the process and make those improvements on a regular basis. 
Now, th these are some, okay. Uh, let me go back to the video. Could this happen where I work? We've all wondered about it. When a problem occurs in healthcare, safety and reputations are at risk. Don't wait for something to go wrong and then try to fix the problem. Failure Modes and Effects Analysis, or FMEA, is a proactive process that allows you to anticipate potential problems before they occur. It identifies potential risk and prioritizes issues so you can work to eliminate the most serious concerns before people are impacted. Basically, the process of failure modes and effects analysis happens in five steps. Step one is to define the scope and topic of the FMEA. For example, proper hand hygiene and placement of hand sanitizer stations at the point of care can help prevent infection. Step two is to assemble a small, multidisciplinary team of experts, all of whom have contact with patients. This team may include administrators, clinicians, nursing assistants, maintenance, housekeeping, and so on. Step three is for the team to chart the process. Create a detailed flowchart of the current process around hand hygiene at the point of care. Right now, a person cleans hands before entering the room, enters the room, provides care, and leaves. Step four is hazard analysis. Identify the potential failures at each step in the process. In our example scenario, potential failure can occur when hand hygiene is not performed after patient contact. Another potential failure is that there are no hand hygiene products or stations at the point of care in the patient's room. You can then classify all failure modes into the risk priority number matrix to determine focus areas based on the probability, detectability, and severity of the failure. The final step is all about actions and measures. Identify how you will prevent the high-risk issues from happening. Buy and install hand hygiene stations. Develop a safety team that trains staff and visually monitors the stations. And create a refill plan so alcohol-based hand sanitizer dispensers are always full. And then adjust the plan as needed. Success is not just following, but also constantly creating effective protocol. Anticipate and prevent problems and reduce cost. That's the FMEA way. So this is actually um, a very nice representation, I thought, uh, of how to do an FMEA, um, and uh, it, it's qu uh, ex explained quite uh, lucidly. So now, uh, if you find that uh, the failure mode is likely to occur, and uh, there, there is uh, a high likelihood you might need to evaluate the causes and see if any of them can be evalu um, can be eliminated actually or mitigated you might want to consider adding a force function something that is a force stop stop the line so that uh, the error can uh, be stopped you can add a verification step such as independent double checks or barcoding on uh, medications or alert screens and uh, modify any other process that is related uh, to that cause. If a failure is unlikely to be detected, you might need to identify what are the events that may occur prior to that uh, failure mode effect um, happening, and this could serve as a flag in order to prevent that next step from happening. You might also want to consider adding a step to the process that intervenes at an earlier event to promote the failure mode. And you might also want to consider technological alerts uh, to the process. So this is how you might be able to improve the process and reduce the risk in the process. Now, if a failure is likely to have a severe and damning effect, then you might need to identify early warning signs and uh, possibly conduct some trainings to the staff so that they might be better prepared to deal with that uh, failure step. For example, they could use uh, training, 
um, and uh, simulation so that they are better prepared to react. You might want to provide them information and resources so that uh, there is early action when the potential uh, failure mode occurs. So in essence, there are three stages to this uh, process. One is you need to identify the failure modes, brainstorm possible ways that failures can happen. This is by the multidisciplinary team identify the causes, assess the risk, provide a rating of 1 to 10 for severity, probability and detectability and then rank them according to the risk priority number. Risk priority number is a multiplication of uh, severity, probability and uh, detectability. Probability and likelihood are the same and act on the highest RPN first. Now this is an example of uh, a FMEA that has been completed. You can see all the steps in the process, the failure modes, the effect, the severity, occurrence, detectability. Then the RPN is a multiplication of uh, severity, occurrence and uh, likelihood. And uh, based on the RPNs, you would rank the steps from say 1 to 5 and uh, uh, start working on the steps uh, from a priority of 1 to 5. Uh, that would be your prioritization uh, matrix. This is another example. Uh, you list all the steps, the failure modes and the effects and the three aspects, LSD and you get the RPN and then you prioritize. This is another example. You, you can also put in the recommended actions for each step so you can um, mitigate the um, failure of that process. Now, uh, just in a summary of uh, the process steps, first you need to choose a uh, scope and topic. You need to list all the steps in the process, list all the failure modes and causes, come up with an RPN, prioritize actions by using the RPNs in order to plan your improvement uh, efforts and you can evaluate the results and uh, use the, the opportunity to flip chart uh, as a source of learning to others. This is generally how the structure of the multidisciplinary team is. You would have a chair, you would have a flip chart recorder, minute keeper and timekeeper. You need to make sure that you come up with some ground rules. One is uh, confidentiality just to make sure that uh, the discussions in the group are uh, internal, need to make sure that people respect each other uh, in terms of the process and their uh, thoughts and the, the effort that they are bringing into the community. Um, stick to timings, make sure that everybody contributes. You need to do the right thing for the right reason, you know, make sure that uh, people don't uh, hide behind uh, certain curtains. Make sure the discussion is unbiased and uh, the discussion has to be non-critical and not non-judgmental and uh, make sure that uh, people who are listening to other people's ideas are active listeners. This is a worksheet uh, that we have developed and I'm happy to share this with uh, um, any of the teams that might be interested uh, to conduct an FMEA. Um, if there are any topics or themes that uh, you want us to help facilitate, we'll be most happy to collaborate. Now just a plug in for the accreditation uh, path for uh, uh, 218. Um, uh, in 2017, we had uh, several accreditation refreshers. We did the HRQ patient safety culture on uh, safety. Um, we did several patient safety and ROP training, self-assessment, uh, process improvement activities. Early 2018, we did uh, self-assessments, uh, action plans. Uh, um, we are still in the process of uh, uh, delivering uh, trainings on ethics, conflict management, uh, workplace violence. Uh, uh, we are going to start to deliver uh, sessions on patient safety and uh, ROPs uh, version 2 because it's an annual exercise. Um, we have the simulated survey coming up in two weeks' time. So uh, just for you to be aware, uh, 
and for th those who are participating, we'll have a little more detailed session. And uh, we'll have the, Innova, the survey in uh, late uh, 2018, possibly the second two weeks of uh, uh, November. So this is, this is kind of the uh, path forward. We'll be in constant communication with uh, all the teams so that uh, uh, you have appropriate uh, information and uh, knowledge to move forward. Also, the communications that Chris is sending, uh, keep a note of them, and uh, they will help you to uh, be better prepared for the accreditation process. Uh, now, in summary, FMEA tra training provides a platform to develop uh, implementation capacity. FMEA facilitates uh, planning and systems improvement, and it helps us to meet uh, accreditation standards. Proper planning upstream prevents problems downstream, and uh, this has been uh, validated many, many times, I guess. Thank you so much. I would open the floor to questions.